morning. I am Norma Kostaka, the new publisher of the North Bay Business Journal. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our annual Sonoma State University event. Our mission at the North Bay Business Journal is quite simple. One, give our business community accurate news and coverage on their business category. Two, provide our business community data and reports to make knowledgeable decisions as to the future of their business category. And three, but definitely not lastly, to provide a forum of experts in the business community to share their experience and intel that makes their business thrive. And today, we will be doing all three. Today's SSU event, we will hear from where we stand in the nation, the state, and the region. And where we stand in the state, the nation, the state, and our regional economy from someone who has for years long looked into the future and reported what we can expect. Later, two of our speakers who have insight into something critical to everyone in the North Bay who is part of the business community, and that's our educational system. We will hear not only from the opportunities, but the challenges ahead for both the state and our region. But before we begin, let's thank our underwriter sponsor for today's event and making this all happen, Exchange Bank. In addition, join me in recognizing our major sponsors who are American River Bank, Gelati Construction, Redwood Credit Union, Sonoma State University School of Business and Economics. As a reminder, please get your questions ready and post them on the Q&A prompt on the Zoom below. Our first speaker will answer questions after his presentation. Later into the event, our other two speakers will be available to take your online questions at the end of their presentations. So now, join me in welcoming the new president and CEO of Exchange Bank, Troy Anderson. Thank you and good morning. On behalf of Exchange Bank, it is our great privilege to underwrite the North Bay Business Journal's annual Sonoma State University Economic Outlook Conference. With the amount of economic and societal disruption that we've all experienced in the past 11 months, our first speaker today has his work cut out for him, but I can assure you that we absolutely have the right person for the job. Dr. Robert Eiler's economic forecasts are based on modeling developed right here at Sonoma State, and they've been highly accurate over the many, many years. Dr. Eiler is Dean of the School of Extended and International Education at Sonoma State University and is a professor of economics and director of the Center of Regional Economic Analysis, also at Sonoma State, where he's been teaching since 1995. Robert earned his PhD from UC Davis in 1998 and his bachelor's degree in economics at Cal State University Chico in 1992. He's also been a visiting scholar at both the University of Bologna and Stanford University. And, Rob comes to us from an agricultural family that has roots in this area going back over 100 years, so he has a keen understanding of our local business community. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Eiler. Thank you for having me today, and thanks for the sponsors, and thanks to the North Bay Business Journal for running this, and to Sonoma State for hosting. Uh, Norma, you can hear me okay? I sure can. Perfect. Thank you so much. So folks, I'm going to try to take you, uh, in a sense, real quick around the nation, the state, and also our region. And I'm going to start with some of the themes that economists are watching here in 2021 so far. The first one is we have a new presidential administration, and that administration is very active in trying to think about a, what we're going to call fiscal stimulus package round three. Uh, the second round is already here and coming. And if you jam those two ideas together, we've seen an enormous amount of fiscal and monetary policy in the last 12 months. And we're going to see some more in 2021. And a lot of the forecasts I'll talk about later are predicated upon the idea that those, uh, the, the second or the, the additional rounds of fiscal policy that are coming alongside of low interest rates are going to continue to stimulate the economy over the next couple of years. However, one of the storm clouds that still hangs over us is how well we're going to get the vaccinations out and how we're going to get those caseloads knocked down to a point where we can start to lift all the social constraints and further. And this is actually the most important point have the uncertainty of reintroducing those social constraints slowly slip away. Without that change in expectations, it's going to take a little longer for businesses to get back on their feet. 
deal with the cost of reopening and staying open and also rehiring workers. Unfortunately, this pandemic has hit our lower income folks and specifically our lower income households the hardest. And so we've seen an uptick in social services demand. We've seen an uptick in food bank demand. And we've seen a lingering time where folks with lower incomes have not been able to get back to work as fast as those with higher incomes. And we'll see a little bit of that later. In terms of forecasts, last Friday, the Philadelphia Federal Reserve came out with their quarterly assessment of 40 forecasters that they interview every quarter and where they see the economy going over the next few years. And since these data are just as of last Friday, I'm showing this up front. I'll talk a bit, a bit about some other forecasts in just a minute to contrast. But these data are in what I kind of call couplets in the sense that the first two columns of data are the real GDP or the gross domestic product after inflation growth rate over the next few quarters and over the next few years. And that shaded area I have there are the new forecasts over the next few quarters. The old forecast or the previous quarter's forecast is next door to that, not shaded. So you can see in, for most cases, the next few quarters have actually seen an uptick in the forecast. And a lot of that is because we've now seen fiscal stimulus round two hit the street. We're expecting a third round and we may see that sooner than later. March 14 is basically the deadline for the unemployment uh, insurance benefits that are currently in place and augmented to stop. So there's there's this sort of looming deadline out there. And under the supposition that we'll get a relatively robust third package, we should see the next few quarters see pretty good growth. Now, a lot of that, again, depends on the caseloads going down. So keep that in mind. And I'll come back and reiterate that point later. This is the unemployment rate forecast. And you can see that that's actually slipping down, meaning that it's actually getting better. And for the most part, the labor market has beat our expectations. I'll talk about this in just a minute but they are still considering the labor market beating expectations specifically versus the previous quarter. And as we'll see in a minute, getting back to where we started 2020, somewhere between 2023, sorry, 2023 or 2024, but that's better than we had six months ago. So each quarter, the forecast is evolving to get slightly better, but a lot of it is predicated upon the idea that we're gonna turn the corner smoothly and keep moving forward as an economy. Here's the next few years. And you can see that these are all also picked up a little bit with respect to about a half a percentage point higher than it was last quarter. A lot of that is because of additional fiscal stimulus coming and further having low interest rates continue for the next few years. And the unemployment rate is meant to follow that over the next few years. So what this forecast is telling you is things are getting better in, the, in most forecasters' minds. I'll corroborate that with some things at the state level and locally as well but we should not expect to get back to where we started 2020 before 2023. Part of that's because we still don't have a lot of people unemployed. So these data are the way in which people are unemployed. This is from January, 2007 forward on a monthly basis to just last month. And we're gonna watch some sort of wild evolution here in the data, which is different than the last recession. Here are people temporarily unemployed. And the reason I showed these dates is because I want to consistently compare it to the Great Recession because the numbers are of a similar magnitude now. And some of the recovery aspects are going to now start to show their faces being somewhat similar. So you can see on the far right hand side, this gray area really spiked in March, April and May, but then started to slip down over summer, which when people are temporarily unemployed, you do expect some quick job come back. And originally in the presidential debates, and in the presidential campaigns, there's a lot of talk about a so-called V-shaped recovery. A lot of it is sort of inverting that gray area and it looks like a V. We went down pretty far and then we came back up very quickly. The problem is temporary layoffs become two things or maybe even three, depending which way you look at it. The one thing they become are people going back to work. The other thing they become potentially is permanent job losers. And so we've seen some of that transition and now you can easily see the Great Recession as that blue hill about a quarter of the way moving left to right. And you can see the total magnitude of job loss is about the same as of the end of January as we were somewhere at the end of 2009. So keep that in mind in terms of where we are in the recovery path, because if some of the same characteristics are starting to boil in to the labor market that we had at the end of the Great Recession, and now, and then ultimately the long, slow recovery afterward, we're starting to see some of those things form. The other way that people become unemployed is that they complete a temporary job and are now seeking work. They leave their job, quit, and are now looking for work. Another dynamic, which you're gonna talk about in a little while in terms of education is people that have left the labor force voluntarily, maybe because they have to, have, uh, they have to deal with childcare at home, but some of these folks are, are primed to be uh, retrained 
and potentially look at career change if they're going to be at home with kids and dealing with the, with the domestic issues in the short term. And then finally, new entrants, which are high school and college graduates, another workforce development issue. So that large section on the far right-hand side, the more rainbow colored that is, the more problematic it becomes. We want most of those temporary jobs to be the dominant force in the folks that are unemployed, but that is now giving way to a more classic recession. And that's really the point of these data is that instead of it being a sort of a quick, more natural disaster look to it, where you have a lot of temporary workers or a lot of temporary layoffs that then become uh, recovered jobs, we're starting to see more permanent job loss and more characteristics of, let's say, a middle ground recession forming. Well, to look at this a little bit more deeply, I'm going to show you some industry level data. Looking at April 2020, looking back one year, the November, December, and January of this year, to sort of get a contrast of how we saw job losses initially, and then recovery. So looking at the industries, these are sort of the classic industries at the, at the national level. You can see on the far right hand side that accommodation, hotels, food services and drinking places, bars and restaurants really saw the heaviest loss. We'll come back and talk about other services, which is a bunch of different sort of hair salons, nail salons, auto shops, things that are not easily characterized in the other categories where most of the loss happens. Now here's November, 2020. In contrast to this difference, the movement up toward that red dotted line means things are getting better. Here's December, which actually gave back a little bit. And then here's January, which gave back a little bit more. So December and January were pretty tough months on the labor market. And if you contrast that to what we said earlier in the forecast, we have to get through the next couple of months to get clear of that resurgence in cases, the stay at home orders now they're slowly lifting across the country and get our workers back to work. Thinking more at the aggregate level, this is what the two last two recessions look like contrasted to each other. If I start the Great Recession with at November 2007, which is basically when the American labor market started to show signs of losses as the Great Recession started to really take hold, you can see that blue bowl is a description of how we lost jobs and then came back. And I'm showing this as an index because I really am more concerned about the timing and getting back to the original level than anything else. And here's where we are on the recovery thus far. So when you add up everything I showed you and from the labor market standpoint, this graph may be the most important because that 93.7 suggests that we're 93.7% of the way home to get back to where we started Janu in January 2020, which is where the black line begins. So we need that black line to go up to the red dotted line as soon as possible. But that curl is concerning because that extends the recovery period, unfortunately, how much more we will see how fiscal stimulus, low interest rates, and general relief from uncertainty start to show its face in the labor market. The financial markets have been maybe a little bit counterintuitive in terms of growth. I'm going to show you the S&P 500 on a monthly basis from January 2000 forward to the end of last month. And you can see there's three recessions over that time period. You can see the dot-com recession, this sort of slow wobbly downturn to a bottom, then some decent pickup in the first decade of the new millennium, down hard in the second shaded area, which was the Great Recession to that 735 number. And then basically a long extended bull market that continues to this day, even though there's been some wild cuts along the way. And you can see the 2652 on the far right-hand side in the current recession we're in. Still, we haven't had it declared over, but I'll come back to this in a minute. You can see it's actually continued to climb up. What's driving this is low interest rates. And because we've moved our lives into more technological spaces, the big firms that drive the S&P 500 have seen a lot of demand for their stock. And the two together are really driving a lot of those equity market outcomes. If there's any wobbliness in terms of interest rates, unpredicted risk that comes in, or we see some changes in the way we're using technology, we probably will see some relief. But for the time being, neither or none of those issues tend to or look like they're going to be in place. So for entertainment purposes only, it look like at least for the next six or eight months, the equity markets look pretty good. So that's a good thing in terms of not having a wealth effect in terms of having that disrupt recovery. What I want to show you now are, infl is our inflation data. So another big question I get a lot is what's going on with prices. If we have all this fiscal stimulus and this very aggressive monetary policy. Is that not a recipe for inflation? And the answer is Historically speaking, yes, but we had very similar conditions at the end of the Great Recession. And that's why I keep comparing that back, because we have similar, in a sense, conditions to that time. Would you not expect a similar outcome in terms of recovery? Well, 
These are business expectations over the last basically nine years. And you can see I started these data in October 2012. And I did that because that's basically when the Great Recession finally gave way across the United States and we started to be in more complete recovery. Flat, super easy expectations, no issue. Then things started to slowly pick up toward the end of the decade. Then they sort of tailed off a little bit as we entered 2020, fell very sharply because of oil prices dropping and generally demand sagging during the initial stages of COVID-19 and then picking back up. Now, this is all looking one year ahead. So notice the, the last data I have on this graph is December 2021. The latest expectations are looking forward one year. Well, let's see how actual expectation or how actual inflation worked against this. And actual inflation looks like this. So when businesses form expectations of inflation, they tend to want to price that through to customers. Well, as things picked up, as you can see, toward the end of the decade, consumer prices picked up a little bit more steam. Then as those business expectations fell, consumers had to see that, well, I know your costs are going down for the time being. You have a lot of surplus inventory because you haven't had as much demand. Prices should fall. And that's exactly what's happened. But that turn on the far right-hand side suggests that we're going to see a little bit more inflation pressure jumping into the economy, especially if we're starting to see fuel prices creep back up, if demand comes back, and we have still some supply chain issues because the entire world economy hasn't figured itself out yet, that inflation is going to creep up a little bit. That red dotted line, the reason I have that there, is because that's where the Federal Reserve is going to be watching very closely in terms of interest rates and maintaining relatively low rates. So if that black line lingers above that red dotted line for a little while longer, we probably will have some pressure inside the Fed to want to increase rates a little bit, assuming that the economic recovery is in full swing. And that's really where you'll see interest rates start to show up its face in terms of lifting up a little bit. Okay, so let's round up the national economy before we get to the state and the local. IMF has the following growth, 5.1% in 2021. We saw earlier 4.5, 2.5% in 2022. We saw earlier a little over three. CBO, the Congressional Budget Office has put out their growth forecast. They think, in fact, we're going to be back at where we started 2020 by the end of this year. So it's going to be very quick to get back 4.6% growth in 2021, 29 in 2022. 2.3 in 2023. All these forecasts, including the one I showed you before, all positive growth going forward. And in the case of the Federal Reserve, expectance rates remain low until there's obvious economic recovery. As I just showed you, the inflation expectations are ticking up a bit, but still very steady and low. And don't expect full jobs recovery until about 2023. And that's a pickup from what we saw early in this episode with respect to how forecasts were seeing the future that we expected the labor market to have some issues for some time. Now, some issues still exist, and it is now good to look at the state and the local level to see how that might lean down into our area. So we certainly are in recovery. There's no doubt about that. The key is actually maintaining that recovery momentum. Quickly, this is the look of the major uh, labor force data for California, which is the first data column, and then the six counties that comprise our local area or we think of as the North Bay region. Now I'm showing you this in percentage changes because I, there's some contrast I want to point out. The bolded bottom row are the unemployment rates. So you'll see that for the most part, except for Lake County, Mendocino County, Solano County is a little bit up there too. We've seen some comeback to relatively low unemployment rates given how high they were six or eight months ago. So this is an evolution of recovery with respect to the unemployment rate is relatively low, still high historically, but not as high as it might have been, uh, but for some of the fiscal policies we've seen and also just simply getting back to work and, and making adjustments given COVID-19 social constraints. That top row is also an intriguing piece to think about. How, have, how has labor force shifted? We've heard an enormous number of stories coming out of real estate, coming out of other parts of our economy that people in California are on the move and they're leaving. Then we hear stories that people are just reallocating themselves around the state. Some of those data in terms of the labor force, the local number of people who are either looking for work or, or are keeping their jobs has gone down. Now that is classic in recession. The key is how long that lingers. Is that an indication that you're seeing workers leave the area because now they're counted in somebody else's labor force? Or is that the people have left the labor force and remain local? Maybe they retired, for example. So we're watching both those indicators to, to watch how the labor force evolves in terms of people coming in and out, looking for work at all ages. 
Now, unfortunately, this recovery has led to what's been called a K-shaped recovery in terms of high wage workers and low wage workers. And I alluded to this in the first slide. This is for California, and this is through the end of November, more or less. You'll see there's a big split here. By the end of November, those that make at least $60,000 a year as a salary had actually seen job growth from January 2020 as the start as a comparison. But those that make less than $27,000 a year, and this is all because there's a national database, and I should explain this briefly, Harvard University, Brown University, and the Gates Foundation have partnered to, to try to track the economy in real time with respect to how the recovery is working. One of the data points they provide is this contrast between high wage workers, middle wage workers, and low wage workers. High wage workers are defined as workers that make at least $60,000 a year to provide national comparisons. Those below $27,000 a year are considered low wage workers. Now that doesn't necessarily e easily translate to high wage and low wage households. But the idea is there's that split that the data are suggesting based on the uh, current population survey coming out of census and that split has gotten wider over time. So you can see 27.1% down for folks that make $27,000 a year or less. But let's think about it. When I showed you that graph before of the industrial changes in jobs, a lot of the changes were in bars, restaurants, hotels, nail salons, hair salons, a lot of services industries that tend to have relatively lower wage workers. Okay. Well, let's look at how California has recovered. Same type of graph we saw earlier with respect to uh, a comparison to the Great Recession. Starting in November 2007, I kept a little bit of the seasonality in here to show you how wobbly the data can be for California, but kind of the same bowl effect in trend, getting back 56 months later to where we started. A little bit faster than the US, but this is the recovery so far for California, very similar to the US at 93.8% home but that same curl at the end. So the nice recovery momentum we saw in the later stages of 2020 have given way a little bit as the caseloads went back up. And scientifically, we knew this was gonna happen. The key is whether or not we were gonna see more job loss and an elongation of the recovery period as a result of this. So we're watching this closely, same deal though, that black line needs to get back up to the red dotted line. Okay, for California, in terms of industrial loss, same basic story, notice, in April, this is again, April to December, 2020, I'm gonna show you it sort of just watching the recovery go from the beginning of the, of the change in COVID from COVID-19 with respect to recession to where we are in the latest data. This is April. So there's November. So from April forward, we, we saw labor market recovery, but in those leisure and hospitality, bars, restaurants, hotels, other services, hair salons, nail salons, these sort of service, industries that are personal services, you're relatively proximate to your client, they still had heavy losses. But this is what happened in December. So we saw an exacerbation of those heavy losses. We kind of knew that was going to come. But how you read these data are important. Those data suggest that, for example, in leisure and hospitality, almost 30% of the jobs that were there one year before that, December 2019, are not there December 2020. In other services, about one in five jobs are not there. Why that's important is because is that an indicator ultimately of the number of businesses that remain open or not? And how does that lead to a change in the capacity to rehire, even if the economic situation has gotten better and our forecasts all play out? Will businesses restart to fulfill demand or are we going to have this sort of sagging demand because we won't have those workers back to work anytime soon? This is for the state overall. Now, it's, I've been... Uh, very humbled to have been asked on the last few years to be part of the California Department of Finance's forecast unit in terms of their final forecast for the governor's budget. I'm on a team of about five or six economists that come and provide them with regional and sort of broader national views to finalize their forecast. This is their employment forecast looking from 2005, the actual data, all the way to the forecast period, which is 2021 to 2024. So you see, here's the Great Recession, and you can see the downturn in jobs. These data represent, on an index basis, starting in November 2007, the amount of employment throughout California, meaning the number of people that have jobs. So you can see the downturn and then a the recovery going all the way up to 110.5, which means there's about 10.5% growth in jobs from the beginning of the Great Recession to the end of the recovery period. And then COVID-19 kicked in. We saw a quick downturn. And then that I have here that the forecast for right now is we will have the recession officially declared over probably 
fourth quarter 2020, maybe first quarter 2021, but probably no farther than that. And we're just waiting for the National Bureau of Economic Research to actually make that declaration. But going forward, nice smooth transition through 2021 and up. Again, assuming all the conditions I told you earlier remain in place, the vaccines are working, business expectations get better, and we make a transition that's relatively clean in terms of not having any concerns of a variant changing business expectations and ultimately consumer expectations and slowing us down again. Okay, now let's look quickly at how the um, Great Recession compares to our North Bay region. So this should have said actually uh, the recovery comparison for the North Bay counties, but here we go. This is the sum of all the North Bay counties and the jobs that have been there starting in November, 2007, that same bowl effect, it took a lot longer than the state overall to fully recover the jobs in our region. It took about 95 months rather than 56. But here's where we are in terms of COVID-19. Again, thinking that what we wanna do is we wanna get the line I'm about to show you back up to the red dotted line. Here's Sonoma County, 94.3% home, but that little downturn means it's gonna be a little bit longer path to get there. Marin County, Napa County. Napa County has had a relatively strong recovery so far. Lake County has been all over the place. Initially a real deep cut. You're gonna see a little bit more detail on this in a second, but saw a nice spike as we got closer to the end of the year and then the downturn. Lake County should be okay by the middle or end of this year with respect to getting back to where we started 2020. It doesn't mean it won't be, it'll be a robust growth, but it'll get, should get pretty close back to where it started. Here's Mendocino County, not as deep a cut, not as good as recovery yet. And then Solano County is about the same as Sonoma and Marin and Napa. Now, the point here again, is that the North Bay is showing signs of recovery. You can see in each one of these shapes, and I'm just gonna take you quickly back through these. This is probably one of the most important graphs I'll show you, that in each case, we saw a quick downturn, but then we saw recovery. We are in recovery mode. We should have the recession declared over in, in an almost like a back casting way very soon, but it doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet. One of the reasons we're not out of the woods is because if you look at the industrial level, we have the same basic characteristics as the national and state economies with respect to the types of jobs and industries that are still seeing relatively heavy job loss. If I look at April 2020, this is the beginning of the recession. This is Sonoma County's change in jobs looking back to April 2019. And that annual, that annual look, the sort of year-on-year -year look, takes some of the seasonality out of the data. Here's Marin County, Napa. Lake was initially, as you saw in the last graph, relatively all over the place initially. Then Mendocino, Solano, and California, just as a, a marker. We saw those data earlier. We're showing them here again for contrast. But the point here is that you'll see the major industries that are hurt, same story. One of the tricky things about this recession is it was very focused on specific industries, mainly around travel, which I'll talk about at the end. And initially there was a lot of pain so that 47% suggests that 47% of the jobs that were there one year previous were gone April, 2020 for the time being. Okay, well now let's look at the same data, but now let's warp all the way to December and see where the recovery happened. Here's Sonoma County, much smaller magnitude. The axes have the same levels. Marin, Napa, Lake came back as we saw in the two graphs ago. Mendocino, Solano, and then California. Now, while there certainly is recovery at the industrial level and in, in kind of a wild way, farming got better, retail got better in most cases, uh, professional services generally recovered to something that looked a little bit more like the end of the Great Depression rather than the middle of it. But that far right-hand side, in hospitality, personal services, bars, restaurants, and hotels, sort of our visitor services amalgam with respect to how we service folks that are coming here and staying overnight specifically, a lot of pain. So still lingering, as you can see in the shaded area at relatively deep cuts versus the previous year. Okay, another way to also see what's happened with respect to looking at changes in the economy is to look at taxable sales. So if we look quarter on quarter in 2020, looking back one year, same quarter, this is quarter one, so this is pre-COVID, relatively straightforward changes, sometimes just basically seasonal with respect to you can have a little bit of hiccups here and there, but you can see the beginnings of COVID-19 start to creep in. Clothing stores, for example, took a quick sag. 
where other retail group, which is on the far right-hand side, and I'll shade this in a minute, are basically what you buy online. But not a whole lot of change here, the beginnings. Here's quarter two. So this is where the heavy hit happened with respect to the change in how we went out to eat. You can see four slots over. It says food services and drinking places. Those are taxable sales inside of restaurants. Very hard hit versus the previous year. You can see clothing stores down 55%. Other retail group, uncharacterized or uncategorized and really a lot of it's online rising. And then here's Q3, which just came out about two weeks ago across all 58 counties in California to, to provide a lot of different comparisons. This is the sum of all six counties to show you that not one county did so well that it picked everybody up. It really was a general problem, but that's that shaded area, two things to think about. One, we're buying a lot of stuff online, so we're getting those taxable sales, which is okay. The problem is we're not necessarily patronizing our local, er, our local area business because we don't have the social uh, constraints lifted to do that on a regular basis. So do these lead to business loss as much as job loss in retail and in restaurants? That's the open question over the next 18 months. But these indicators, as if we don't get those columns that are below the red dotted line back up above it, we're going to have problems with some of our businesses staying in business. So keep that in mind because a lot of the pain, again, happened in uh, areas where taxable sales take place. So it's one way of tracking it. This is also a way of thinking about local public finance and where there may be some continued sags for our counties and cities with respect to holes on the revenue side. So because the data were so crazy this year, I decided not to do a re-up of our normal index. I've shown you most of the components of the index. And what I want to do now is I want to round those out. Building permits are down. Now, part of that's because we could not work the same way and developers got a little bit concerned, even with low interest rates about starting new projects. We have some projects in the pipeline and construction employment has remained relatively stable, but permits are down across the board in California and in the North Bay. We just got some data that suggested our great prices in our harvest were less than we expected. Smoke, fire, COVID, the combination of everything above led to some uh, kind of a wild year for grapes 2020. So that might linger on for the next few years in terms of vintages and having as much wine on the market. But grapes, uh, the agricultural industries go through this. The wine industry has gone through these sort of ups and downs. This one was a little bit more forced. So expect there might be about 18 months more pain in the wine industry, but they'll turn the corner. And a lot of it's going to depend on how our visitors come back. And our initial claims for unemployment insurance are still at relatively high historic levels. So the normal ways that I would look forward still have some problems against relatively strong recovery momentum. So overall, what we really need, and this is the key, general recovery has started, but we need to get the threat of the social constraints out of the way so businesses and consumers have better expectations formation going forward. One of the things that's a huge contrast with the Great Recession versus this recession is median home prices. We've had better changes in home prices this time and really a lot of positive demand. This is the last year, December back to December, 2020 to 19 across the North Bay, really strong performance in median home prices. This is the two-year look, which means most of the growth across our region with respect to home prices has been over the last year. So this is good, but I'll come back to why this is also tricky in a minute. This is the forecast looking one year ahead. And these data come from Zillow. Most housing economists have the same basic outlook for California, a little over 6% growth over the next year in the North Bay, about the same or maybe a little de better depending on where you are. We're watching to see if there's a lot of migration around California with respect to moving from urban to rural areas and how that's going to hold up. But expect that for the time being, given low interest rates and potential economic recovery, all the, the mechanisms are there to keep housing prices relatively stable. Okay. Well, to wrap up, those forecast assumptions, everything I've told you is so much dependent upon the fiscal stimulus playing out that is truly stimulative, whether or not we get another round of government investment. And there's a lot of debate now about how big the third fiscal stimulus package should be versus actually having investment in, by government in buying goods and services rather than engaging what you call a transfer payment to households and businesses. We will see how that plays out. We should be on track for continued jobs recovery. We've got to get around this next couple of months or so and get the, those vaccines working and try to get those caseloads going down. But everything seems to be trending in the right direction. That K-shaped recovery is something to watch because the longer those 
services jobs remain unemployed, the longer we might see that split linger around. But there's a great opportunity there in terms of workforce development, which uh, Londa and, and JF are going to talk about at length here in a little bit. The travel industry is probably the one big worry area for our local economy. Whether or not people come back, whether they can come back, the international visitors, their ability to come to the local area, all that is in question and challenges absolutely remain. We do expect housing stability, which is good if you own, this is what I wanted to come back to, not great if you're trying to own. So the housing crises we talked about two years ago have not gone away, even though we've gone through a recession, they potentially have been exacerbated because we've slowed down building permits. That's why I wanted to bring that up against rising prices otherwise, because we're seeing demand reallocate itself around the state. And then finally, as a tee up for what's coming, there's certainly some education and workforce opportunities. Education is the best way to break out of a recession and really stave off recession long-term. That goes from K through 12 to our community colleges and ultimately to Sonoma State as an example of uh, higher education otherwise. Our MBA programs are a place where if you're thinking about training managers and you're thinking about the next stages, please check out our programs. JF's gonna talk a lot about this too. But folks, that's basically where I see things going. We look pretty good for the next couple of years. We still have some headwinds, which obviously are generated a lot because of the social constraints. But if we turn the corner and we're getting more be or better expectations, the next couple of years should be pretty good. So with that, Norma, I'll hand it back over and thank everybody again for coming today uh, for questions. As always, Dr. Eiler, thank you for making, us, making as much sense as we can of the economy and where it's at right now. We really appreciate it. Thanks also to Troy for introducing Dr. Eiler. Now let's see if we have any questions for you. We, we have one, uh, Dr. Eiler, you've told us that people have left the workplace, not just being laid off, but some, especially women, because of the pandemic. What is the outlook for them returning or not returning? The outlook kind of depends on what uh, your job was previously. So if you were in a relatively low wage job previously, the probability of you getting the job back or being rehired quickly is lower, unfortunately, than if you were in a higher wage or a job that has, let's say, a bachelor's degree or higher as the minimum qualifications for the job. Uh, that K-shaped recovery, unfortunately, is going to affect you if you are a mom who got laid off and or you chose to walk away because you had child care issues, which totally is understandable. Getting back in the workforce is unfortunately probably split along those let's say wage and qualification lines. Okay, thank you. One other question. Detail for our audience, what are the keys to watch for in the recovery of the restaurant industry um, recovery, where it has been reported as many as 30% of restaurants closed in the pandemic will not open? Yeah, the two major indicators are what you're hearing on the street with respect to the cost of reopening and staying open. So mm -hmm. under the supposition that you're gonna be in this sort of phased in process, we can't just sort of snap your fingers and boom, you're back like you were December, 2019. Uh, for some restaurants, they're gonna find the increase in the cost to remain quote unquote safe uh, might be too much to stay in business. And that maybe has not completely shown its face yet. So the cost of doing business and how that ultimately impacts a business's ability to reopen and really the more crucial thing to stay open is key. But on the demand side, we need our visitors to come back strong. So mm -hmm. a lot of our restaurants here rely on a dual audience, our local residents and sort of, let's say, a regional audience that kind of flows in and out for work purposes. But then ultimately is going to be the out the incoming visitors from all over the world that come in and supplement that revenue on the other side. And that goes for everybody. We just we need more bodies to be here because that's really the revenue models that we built over a long period of time. Thank you, Dr. Eiler. We appreciate the answers. You bet. Okay. Now, it is my pleasure to pivot to another area that's critical to everyone in the business community, the future of our education. If you have, a, if you have parented a child, hired a new employee, or aspired to move up by adding ed educational credentials, you can relate to our next topic, the future of education. To know where we, where we are and where we might be headed in education, we are honored today to hear from someone who has that big picture in mind. Long Day Josie holds a PhD and is a senior policy advisor 
for Higher Education for Governor Gavin Newsom. She is the former executive director of California Competes and a nonpartisan nonprofit project that develops and advocates on behalf of policies equitable, equitable which is an equitable boost to California's post-secondary degree attainment. She also now serves on the advisory committee for the Higher Education Policy Center at the Public Policy Institute of California. We are especially honored that Dr. Josie joins us on the very day that her office has released a report, Where the Future Lies, outlining the challenges higher education faces and we merge as we merge from this pandemic. Welcome, Londe. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, Norma. And thank you to um, all of you for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be with you, particularly this morning, because our report just went live about 45 minutes ago. Um, and so I wanted to just start this morning by talking a little bit about some of the mega level trends, which really very much uh, echo so much of the very insightful information that Dr. Eiler uh, left us with um, in terms of what we are seeing at, at a state level and then use that to, to get a deeper lens into what that means for higher education. So um, let me start um, by sharing my slides. Great. Um, so as you all know, uh, I'm gonna talk for about 15 minutes or so, and then I will certainly um, open it up for, for questions um, that you all see, see fit. As you all know, um, you know, California really has been facing three, three crises in what was uh, really an unprecedented year in, in 2020. Um, the first crisis, as Dr. Eiler already spoke to, really was the pandemic itself. Um, we saw that uh, an, an enormous number of people, uh, almost 450,000 Americans uh, died from the pandemic, um, about 10% of which were Californians. Um, so this has been an issue that, um, that the administration has been tackling um, Full, full on 100% um, since the pandemic began last, last March. And uh, we are continuing to give you know, the vast majority of our attention to issues related to, to health and to health care. And while we in the last several weeks have seen trends, um, things trend downward uh, and an increasing number of vaccines, it's certainly not the case that we are out of the woods just yet. Um, and so the, the healthcare response still is at the forefront of, of, our, um, of our management. Uh, the, the second piece is the economic crisis that was uh, spawned in many ways by the pandemic. Um, you know, I can't speak to uh, in, in anywhere near the, the tremendous detail that Dr. Eiler did to the, the economic concerns, but as you know, um, unemployment peaked last year at about 16.4%. Um, it's now down uh, to roughly 9% and our, uh, at the same time we, had a, a huge dip in our, our uh, finances and ended up with a $54 billion deficit last year that we had to solve for. Um, because of that, that K-shaped recovery, things actually uh, look more positive now than they did certainly even six months ago. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult time for many, many Californians who still remain unemployed. Obviously we're going through huge tectonic shifts in terms of many of the industries in the state. And we're still forecasting some um, long-term economic dislocations in terms of uh, structurally what our budget deficits uh, may look like. Uh, and then the third issue that we're really responding to and thinking through is the racial reckoning. Um, you're all familiar with the tragic murder of um, George Floyd last year, and um, that has had reverberations, not just in California, but across uh, the nations. Uh, Californians of color, particularly black, and Latinx and indigenous Californians have been disproportionately impacted uh, by the virus, by the struggling economy, and by the racial reckoning. And we're, we all have a responsibility collectively as a, as a state and as a society uh, to think about how we're gonna recover um, from the combination of these three crises. Uh, if you ask me, and not just because it's my job, um, 
higher education really sits at the center of all that because it's at the center of both thinking about where we are now and where we're going and how, how we will get there in terms of an economic recovery and in terms of thinking about what it takes to heal, uh, heal our state, heal our nation and, uh, and come out uh, better than we were on the other side. Um, now, there's no doubt that uh, our colleges and universities um, have been at the center of many of the COVID-19 outbreaks. Uh, you can see from this particular map where we've had hotspots across the nation. Um, I'm proud to say that California, relatively speaking, has not had the kind of challenges that many of uh, colleges and universities have had in other states. But we have to remember that's because many of our colleges and universities have pivoted primarily to online. Um, they are operating certainly, but they are operating with very few face-to-face -face courses um, and students have taken advantage of the ability to uh, have distance learning. Um, but if you talk to students about that experience, um, they certainly have, have something to say. Um, I think that we are certainly in a position where we're thinking about reopening in the fall. Uh, we think that both the, the vaccines and the possibility of getting to herd immunity will be helpful. Um, certainly, um, you know, if right now the vaccines are tested for those, I think one of the vaccines is for 16 and over and one's for 18 and over. So we don't really have a good sense of how many of our students will choose to be vaccinated. But, um, you know, as uh, many of the faculty and staff on our college campuses are eligible uh, for vaccination now. So we're hoping that that uh, and the combination of students who may be able to be uh, vaccinated will mean that our college and universities can open in the fall. Um, you know, the economic crisis um, has had a huge impact on the economics of higher education. Uh, it's the case that, uh, that the UC and CSU and community colleges uh, last year experienced what we call trigger cuts, which is that everyone kind of got cut because we because of that $54 billion deficit that we experienced. Um, those cuts um, came at a time where many of the um, revenue sources that from auxiliary services, things like um, dining halls and residence halls that are uh, you know a source of, of profit for our college and universities was not there anymore. And so a number of our colleges and universities are experiencing massive um, uh, shortages in terms of revenues and are really trying to figure out how do they make themselves whole and how do they continue then to serve students in ways in which students best need to be served, including being able to provide them with adequate financial aid, because certainly the needs that students have uh, to be able to go to school have also increased as many of their families are out of work um, as well. Um, in terms of financial aid, uh, students and families are, are certainly struggling. Uh, in particular, students of color uh, are struggling to afford the cost of attendance. They were struggling even before the pandemic. It has only been intensified and exacerbated. Um, what I will say is that we have seen in terms of um, one of the effects of this has been a decline in applications for many of the students, uh, low income students, students of color, next generation students in California. Uh, we have uh, varying degrees of, of enthusiasm or not enthusiasm, we have varying degrees of uh, enrollment patterns uh, at our different types of institutions. Our community colleges are experiencing counterintuitively a huge dip uh, in many cases in enrollment um, as much as you know, 10% off, I think it's seven to 8% statewide. I know there's one college that is uh, off by 20% in the state in terms of enrollment. Uh, the the uh, CSUs have had some softening in terms of their applications. The UCs, it, it's blown through the roof with 20% increases. Uh, I think that's actually due to a different factor, which is the fact that uh, for the first time, the UCs are not using uh, test scores, ACT and SAT scores. And so we're, we're seeing a huge shift right now in terms of what's happening. Um, but all of this will be undergirded by what the availability of resources is uh, for students as we think about that going forward. Um, one aspect of the affordability challenge has really been the digital divide. Um, what we found is that if you were a student who did not have access to higher education, uh, did not have access to the internet and reliable access and sufficient bandwidth, you were not able in these last nine months to meaningfully uh, take advantage of your education. And so what we are thinking about with distance learning is that we have to make digital equity a priority for our students, uh, because I don't think that we are going back to exactly what we had before 
in January 2020. Uh, I think that we are trying to understand where can we have really effective, high quality uh, distance learning and, and what ways do we need to continue to have face-to-face -face learning because that is the um, most effective method of uh, not just teaching, but of learning for students. And so thinking about the digital divide is gonna be important. I think there was a recent report out by the Education Trust West that showed that more than 100,000 California students still lacked access to um, the internet or adequate devices. Uh, the governor's office certainly made a significant effort raising millions of dollars to help support um, device uh, distribution. And I think we were able to purchase about a half million devices uh, for students who were um, lacking devices. That was largely though for, for our K-12 students. So as we think about affordability, it's not going to only be thinking about tuition and fees, thinking about rent and food uh, and books, but we have to think about technology as being central to those needs. Um, unfortunately, uh, the digital divide isn't the only tech related challenge that we're facing. Uh, students have also found that distance learning has been challenging for them. And so we're really trying to dig in here and understand what is challenging about the distance learning experience, uh, both for students and also for several of our, our faculty. Um, I think that there has been some concern that students aren't getting the, um, the diversity or the, the depth of support that they need in this particular distance learning format, uh, which has caused many students to withdraw. Others have reduced their course load significantly. And some have, as I mentioned, postponed higher education altogether. And so moving forward, I think as we increasingly rely on distance learning as one of a, a set of tools in our toolbox for educational delivery. We need to think about how do we empower instructors to teach online uh, and, and give them the tools that they need to make sure that that education is um, meaningful and again, uh, uh, that, that they feel supported, that students feel supported, and that it is the highest quality education we have. Uh, to think about race, of course, the racial reckoning and how that has played out in higher education. Uh, the, recently, the Education Trust produced this report, which details how selective institutions uh, have been and certainly continue to be inaccessible for many black and brown students across this nation. We know that students of color uh, and our black and brown students in particular are disproportionately underrepresented in higher education institutions and especially in our four-year institutions. And we know that these students are far less likely to have a college going culture in their home. Uh, as a result, they struggle to navigate the very, the Byzantine and, and complex um, systems that we have for admissions, for transfer, for um, navigating once they're there and for completing. And we know that those who often do make it, make it uh, feeling like they never really belonged in that institution. And it leaves them with a sense of um, not really uh, feeling fully uh, empowered or equipped to go out and then make their, their way in the world. And so that leads me to think about what's the bottom line across all of these as we think about um, the bottom line for me uh, and for, for policymakers, I think our challenge is to really dig into what should equitable, high quality 21st century education look like? What does that look like in this moment? And how do we architect a plan for getting there? Now, I can't purport to have all of the answers because I think it's a really complex question, but I do think that there are a couple of flags or some insights. One is I think that we need to really think about our higher education uh, institutions uh, with equity as a fundamental principle of design. Uh, and too often what happens is that we think about equity as an add-on, something that we um, will, will add to an existing strategy uh, that will devote resources to, to shore up um, how certain things are happening. But it's not something that we fundamentally mold our work around. Uh, and a lot of that is because we have existing practices, existing norms, and it takes quite a bit of, of energy and uh, uh, drive to upset the entire apple cart and to think about a complete redesign. But I think if we want students to be successful, if we want the diversity of students that we have in the state of California to be successful, particularly in ways that enable them to be the talent pool that the state needs for our state and regional economies, we've got to rethink how we design our higher education systems. We've got to think about how each piece of the system 
impacts those students with the least amount of family wealth, with the least amount of privilege, with the least amount of social capital, and with the least amount of social belonging. Uh, so I wanna give some examples about how we are thinking about putting this principle into place. Some of those examples stem from the budget. We made a number of investments in this year's uh, governor's budget. Um, one way that we can drive change is to really think about um, what are some of the uh, specific proposals that we can uh, implement. So we've put a number of resources or $295 million into emergency financial assistance grants across our higher education systems, because we know that students themselves are struggling. We've put money, as you can see here, into food and housing insecurity, and also to think about meeting students' tech needs and mental health needs. The mental health effects of the pandemic on California students has been enormous. Um, it's been enormous for our college students, for our high school students, and for our young students in K-12. And so we've been thinking about how do we um, really support that. Uh, we put additional money into our Cal Grant system, which as you know, is the state's need-based financial aid system, totaling a to uh, $2.4 billion, but we put in an additional 58 million to restore what we call the Cal Grant A eligibility, which is for students who were impacted by their change in living status because of the pandemic, they had to go home, which somehow then meant they were ineligible for some of those funds. Yet we know that students were trying to, uh, many students moved out of apartments to move home with their families and still had to pay rent. So we continued to put money into their Cal Grant and to make them eligible for those resources. Uh, we added uh, 35, we're proposing to add, this is all under proposal, to add $35 million so that we can increase the number of competitive grants to 50,000. Uh, competitive grants are the Cal grants that are available to students who have been out of college for a year or more up until the age of 28. So if you didn't go right after graduating from high school, you were still eligible for a state grant and we're trying to offer 50,000 of those. Um, that would be significant in terms of the growth over the last several years, recognizing that we still have, I think around 250,000 to 300,000 students who apply for one of these competitive grants. Um, and then finally, we've dedicated um, or are proposing to dedicate $20 million to increase access for financial aid um, to foster youth in particular who have circumstances that uh, don't allow them to have a safety net that many other students have. Uh, we also have some expectations of the institutions as we propose this. One is that we they will develop uh, some clear uh, goals in terms of how they're going to close equity gaps and some strategies for doing so with a, a deadline of how they're going to do that, that we're going to ask the uh, higher education institutions to look at how they can create a dual admission pathway so that students who may want to start at their community college can get into college from high school, get into their four year, know where they're going, even have access to some of the resources resources on their local uh, campuses um, as they are doing their work at a local community college. Uh, we put money into professional development. We put money into various workforce systems. We're really trying to think about how we can advance all of this in ways that serve both our local economies, our regional economies, our state economy, and our higher education system. The final piece I wanna talk about before um, taking questions is our Recovery with Equity Task Force. And I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you and a shout out to Judy Sakaki who served on this task force with us for the last six months. President Sakaki was a wonderful partner in much of this. Um, we put together this task force because everyone back in April and May of last year was very uh, agitated about what was happening. And it was very clear to us that at some point a point unknown, but at some point we would be on the other side of COVID-19, on the other side of the recession. And we needed to have some, some time to think about what did we want higher education to look like at that moment? And I think the government is working at its best when it is both serving the needs of, of Californians today, but also thinking about where is California going in the future? And what we've decided is that it wasn't enough to think about going back to our old definitions or our old understandings or practices of equity as they existed in January 2020. But in fact, what we wanted to do was to reimagine what and redesign what an equitable system could look like on the other side of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic. And so that is really where we um, got to. We came up with four kind of key principles that each of which had a set of recommendations associated with it. So the first principle was how do we develop and design truly inclusive institutions uh, that all of our students have a deep sense of belonging. 
Um, and we came up with this goal that uh, by 2030, and that's the goal that we use for all of these goals, that learners of all backgrounds will really feel that they are valued and supported and affirmed within their institution. And that the strategies that we need to get there will involve improving the diversity of faculty, staff, and administrators in our higher education institutions, cultivating an inclusive and engaging learning environment so that students feel like they are a part of it, and then really thinking about student retention. Uh, because we do tend to lose when we look at who leaves higher education, by and large, students who are those new next gen students are the ones who are leaving. So how do we think about student retensive retention through providing a set of supports that will help keep students there that are like some of those that we've already teed up, whether it's around, uh, you know, tutoring or mental health services um, or, or digital equity. The second is really thinking about how do we streamline the pathway to actually getting a degree, to getting access and to moving around our higher education. The truth is most of our students don't go to a single college in California. Most of our California students touch upon two or more colleges as a part of their academic journey. And so we needed to really think about how do we streamline that so that students don't have the transaction cost of moving from one institution to another. To do that, we're thinking about three strategies. One is to establish an integrated technology platform for college admissions and transfer where all students would go to apply or enroll in an institution. Because then you could have a student say, I wanna look at these CSUs, these UCs, this community college, and they'd be able to do it from one place. Our vision includes being able to, to uh, preload uh, their transcripts so that they would know if they're A through G ready and really try to, again, reduce the transaction costs of applying and or transferring. The second piece is around this dual admissions pathway uh, for UC and CSU that I already mentioned. And then the third piece is really pulling our, higher, our, our community college system together to get them to do some common course numbering. It is uh, unconscionable in many ways that uh, every single uh, community college in the state has a different English 101. It might be English 101 here, English 102 there, English 105 here. And what that means is that it is more difficult for our four-year institutions to understand, do these students have the credits that they need? So we are talking about how do we streamline that so that there's common course numbering, starting with those general education courses and then going into what are the associate's degree for transfer pathways. Our third set of recommendations is about how we facilitate some of the transitions for students, not just getting into college, but from uh, in terms of thinking about some of the early work. And so we really want to think about, are we taking full advantage of dual enrollment? Are we providing high tech, high touch advising? Uh, Georgia Tech does a beautiful job of having a whole app that provides prompts for students all across their academic pathway to make sure that they're getting the information they need when they need it. That is what our system needs to do. And how are we making sure that we're enhancing student preparation for their higher education? Finally, we wanna make sure that we're simplifying the sets of supports that students need in order to be stable and in order to have retention. What we know about California students is that many of them do not have the resources that they need. Um, many of our students are food insecure, housing insecure. Uh, many of the students who in high school are on free and reduced lunch are the ones who end up food insecure in college. We know when they're in high school that they're on free and reduced lunch and we can do a better job ensuring that that information is transferred to their four-year institution to pre-enroll them in programs like CalFresh so that they have the resources to be able to take care of themselves as a college student. We wanna make sure that we get uh, inter internet access and not just internet access, but sufficient bandwidth for students and that we improve college affordability writ large. Um, again, the task force report is available at California postsecondary education for all.org. I encourage you to uh, take a look at it and thank you for being with me this morning. Thanks. Thanks, Londe. You know, as, as a spouse and an aunt to an educator, the, the slides nail the landscape of what's happening right now with higher education. So thank you for sharing that with us. Also, you shared with us a 45 minute rep um, you know, report that was just released 45 minutes. So we are absolutely honored to not only have you as a speaker, but honored that you trust us to share that report with us on our event. So thank you very much. All of us needed to hear what you have said, Londe, not to come out of the pandemic, 
Um, but to seek back to where we are educationally. Um, but to build, and we, with this, we need to build on the experience and make it better. And we're all in this together. As a reminder to our audience, we've got great panelists right now. The questions are coming in like crazy, which is terrific. We'll keep them coming, write them down, and we'll definitely be able to answer some of them for you. And now we are blessed this morning to have another guest speaker uh, with us who is relatively new to our area, but had, certainly has a wealth of business and education ex expertise. Dr. J.F. Coget. We call him Dr. J.F. Dr. J.F. joined Sonoma State University as Dean of School of Business and Economics on July 1st of last year. After serving 14 years at Cal Poly, San Luis Abismo, and most recently as Associate Dean. Dr. J.F. was born in France, served in the French Navy, and a PhD from the Anderson School of Management at UCLA. We all know the opportunities offered by SSU in the business education, but let's hear about the current trends in this program today from Dr. J.F. Coge. Welcome, Dr. J.F. Glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Norma. Uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, as Norma said, I'm uh, new to the region and uh, uh, I'm happy to uh, have a chance to uh, talk to the business community today. Uh, I also want to thank Rob for an excellent forecast and uh, Lendy uh, Josie for, uh, for her excellent presentation. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit today about uh, the, the future of uh, education as I see it from my point of view as Dean of the School of Business uh, and uh, more specifically talk about the effect of the pandemic, uh, what we've learned from it, and what strategies we are developing in response to it uh, and, and in, in uh, response to the future we see after it. Um, as Norma shared, I was at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo when the, the pandemic hit. Uh, I was associate dean, so I, I saw the pandemic uh, in March uh, there, there. And then uh, on July 1st, I came to Sonoma State and uh, I, I saw the, the, the pandemic at Sonoma State from that time on. Um, so first, let me tell you a little bit uh, about the impact that we experience. Uh, in March 2020, uh, when the uh, stay-at-home order hit, uh, we were all of a sudden uh, forced to pivot to online learning. Uh, and that means that uh, both Cal Poly and Sonoma State didn't have a whole lot of experience in online learning, and we were forced to learn really fast. Um, and uh, just like a lot of other businesses, uh, the first knee-jerk reaction was to transfer the face-to-face -face classes that you normally have to online via Zoom. Uh, so that's, that was a knee-jerk reaction. That was the easy thing to do. Uh, it's not the perfect solution, but it worked. Uh, and uh, that's what a lot of uh, instructors did. However, uh, there was a decision made early in the summer by the, the CSU, the Cal State system, to, to uh, be remote and online for fall uh, 2020. Uh, and that gave, that there was a decision that was not followed by other universities in other parts of the nation. And uh, others decided they were going to be back in person. And I think the CSU made the right decision. They prioritize uh, safety, health safety over financial uh, uh, returns, right? Uh, there's a lot of money lost in uh, having decided to go online, but that allowed our faculty to plan for uh, fully, to have the whole summer to plan to offer uh, online courses. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the models that we've all explored, right? I mean, this has been a grand experiment in online learning. Insofar as even though some universities have done online learning for a while, uh, the, the, the Cal State system has had less ex experience with it. Uh, and maybe we've been a little bit uh, in the past uh, slower to adopt this innovation. And so in, in this way, I think the pandemic was a, was a positive that gave us an opportunity to experiment, right? Um, so that we're all familiar with the traditional in-person learning approach where you sit in a classroom in front of a professor. That model, by the way, has been contested and evolved 
uh, over the last few years. You know, we've been, we all know that just sitting in front of a lecture uh, that is not interactive is not necessarily the best way to learn. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll define a few terms. So you have in-person education, then you have online education. Hybrid is when you have a mix of in-person classes and online courses, right? Now, when you have an online course, though, you can have a course that's synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous is when you have something that's happening live at the same time. So we are in a synchronous experience right now. However, you could have a recorded uh, lecture or, uh, or some material, uh, written material that's available online, uh, and you don't have to do it in real time uh, with the instructor at the same time being there. So that's asynchronous, right? Um, and what we've learned uh, over the, the, uh, the summer last year was that uh, we didn't need to recreate the in-person classes online in the same way via Zoom. It was possible to redesign courses for them to be asynchronous uh, with recorded lectures, uh, with materials and assignments that can be done uh, without the instructor being there. And so that's, there, there was a lot of experimentation with that model, right? By Kronos is another term academics love to come up with new terms, which is a mix of asynchronous and synchronous, which means that some of the material you, you, uh, you attend uh, on your own time, and sometimes you meet in person to have discussions and interaction around it. Um, there's yet another model called HyFlex, uh, which is a model where uh, you have a, core, a, a class that's happening in person in a classroom, and at the same time, there's also technology that captures it and rebroadcasts broadcasts it online for students who are not there uh, in person. Uh, and that's a model that some universities have uh, uh, experimented with. It's complicated because you need both the technology, uh, the, the instructor has to manage the classroom live and also pay attention to the technology and the questions that are coming uh, uh, off, you know, uh, through the online audience. Um, so what have we learned? Uh, I think one of the first lesson was we, we learned that we can do it, that online education is, is possible, right? Uh, we had a lot of faculty, you know, typically uh, maybe the older faculty who might have been more re resistant and reluctant to think that online education was, was, could be good, could be quality. Uh, maybe some, some uh, students might also have been skeptical about the value of online education, right? So, uh, I want to say, you know, this is no mean, no, no small feat. You know, we've learned it is possible. Online education works somewhat, right? What else have we learned? Uh, we've seen some preferences among our students. Now, I, I can tell you that there's no universal preference. Uh, one person likes one thing and another person likes its contrary, right? So, but by and large, we have found that our undergraduate students prefer asynchronous classes to synchronous classes online. Uh, and that's because it offers them flexibility. That's, that's our hypothesis, right? Uh, many students have uh, jobs, uh, they have a lot of other activities and uh, with an asynchronous class, uh, they can study when they want. They can uh, make it work with their schedule. Now, preference doesn't mean that it's the best quality. I'm just talking about their preferences, right? There is evidence uh, that maybe it's not the most effective, that there's some disengagement when you have asynchronous classes. So, so that's a challenge with that. Um, from our graduate students, uh, we have found that uh, they, they tend to prefer a bichronous model because uh, if you'd simply replicate a class that's, they say, three hours on Zoom, everybody who has sat through a three hour Zoom call, if you have, a, a, you know, I'm sorry for you, uh, knows how, how much, you know, how difficult it is. They Zoom fatigue, right? So, so the idea is like, it's, it's, it's important to shorten the, the, the class time, make it uh, more impactful, really focus on the key points and uh, the parts that can be done asynchronously that don't require interaction can be done uh, in other ways. Uh, Dr. Ejozi spent a lot of time talking about equity gaps. This is something else we've noticed. Uh, our students who don't have good bandwidth, who don't have a place where they can be uh, isolate themselves and, and uh, focus and concentrate, uh, who might not have good uh, equipment even. Uh, for them, it's, a, it's more of a challenge to uh, attend online classes. So uh, we've done some things at Sonoma State uh, with the library, uh, lending laptops, with the hot, hot spots being distributed 
for students who don't have uh, internet connection, but much more needs to be done. Um, there's been an impact on our uh, enrollment. Um, typically, when you have a recession, you see uptick in graduate education, uh, people who might have lost their job or might not have gotten the job that they were uh, planning to get at the end of the undergrad. Sometimes uh, they decide to stay, stick around and get a master's degree or an MBA. So we have a slight uptick in graduate programs. On undergraduate programs though, we have, we have, uh, we've seen a downtick. Uh, minus 15% of new, uh, in, in fall 2020, of new first time freshmen for, for Sonoma State. Uh, and you know, some of it might not just be the pandemic. Some of it might uh, be due to the fires we've experienced. Some of it is due to demography, our region, the North, uh, Northern California, uh, North Bay has uh, uh, the demography, the number of students, college students is, is going down. Uh, there's also a high cost of living here. Um, but you know, fundamentally, I think the difference is undergraduate students come to college is an experience. Uh, and it's not just something, a degree or, or you know, to learn, you know, and so uh, when you're not in person, that experience is lost. So, so that might be part of the, uh, the pattern. Um, so what, what are our strategies uh, when we look at what we've learned and uh, the impact? Uh, first, uh, we want to refocus on our core mission. And I'm, I'm thinking the core mission is of the CSU, right? Uh, it's to promote social mobility in California. Uh, and the way we do so is to provide affordable quality education. And I want to emphasize here that the CSU is, is a model for that. Uh, and here's, here's a, a data. The, the CSU tuition uh, is on average $7,000 a year. Now compare that to the UC, which is $14,000 a year for California residents, right? It's much higher for non-residents. And uh, on average in the US, $32,000 a year for private universities, right? So 7,000, uh, we, we are affordable. That's, a, that's an asset, right? Uh, now we need, we need to continue to, we need to provide quality while at the same time being affordable. And that's, that's, that's something we're working on. Uh, I think it's also important for us to, to remind ourselves that we are supposed to launch students into careers. So we need to provide them with the skills that employers want uh, and the skills to get employed and develop relationships with the business community. Uh, and, and finally, we, we, we play a role to uh, meet the works first needs of the region. So we need to understand what does the region need in terms of graduates? What skills do they need? What degrees do they, do they need? How can we uh, incentivize students who come to Sonoma State to stay in the region and get employed here. Um, so Sonoma State is known for its small class sizes, which provide an intimate education and uh, a lot of interaction with professors. And that's, that's great. Uh, but one of the things that I see in the future is with declining budgets, uh, a, we need to become more efficient, more effective, right? Uh, so while I think it's key that we preserve the small class sizes where they make sense. Uh, I think it's also important to start to experiment, to continue the experiment of online. What online uh, provides is an ability to scale, you know, a word used in Silicon Valley a lot. Uh, if you have a larger online class, uh, you, can, you can provide, uh, you can teach more students with one instructor and you can use technology to still customize the experience they have. So I think that's the things that, the lessons we're learning with online education right now are gonna stay with us in the future. We're gonna to continue to experiment with that while also coming back to in-person, small, high touch learning experiences where, and I would challenge instructors to define what high touch means. You know, it could mean uh, industry projects. It can mean highly uh, interactive experiences. If an instructor just delivers a flat lecture in a small class size, then there's no benefit in it being small. You know, I would argue that it should, you know, it should be a larger experience. Um, there's a lot of interest in also the hybrid and high flex model. Uh, high flex is, is, is not something we are encouraging too much right now because it's, it takes a lot of effort to get up and ramping. But for fall 2021, we're definitely looking at hybrid, a mix of online and in person. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, interesting experiments that will take, uh, that take place there. Finally, th there's a demand for fully online programs. I'm thinking about for graduate programs, for certificate programs that are aimed at uh, students who 
are in the workforce, who have families, uh, who need more flexibility, uh, there's demand for that. And so we, we will be exploring offering that. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion was, was uh, mentioned uh, a lot in the Dr. Joseph's presentation. And that's something that we also focus a lot uh, insofar as our role is to promote social mobility. Um, so one initiative that I've launched that will start in fall this year is, is creating a center for professional engagement in the School of Business and Economics that will uh, connect together scholarships for underrepresented students and underprivileged students, but also scholarship enough, uh, alone are not enough. Uh, we're going to pair those with internships and mentorship programs to really accompany students uh, from the moment they enter our school to placing them into jobs, right? Um, we have a number of scholarships. Uh, uh, there's the Wine Industry Scholarship Program that's, uh, uh, that is a program for uh, children of uh, uh, farm workers in the wine industry that uh, we have that uh, uh, is, we've so far raised $684,000, um, uh, sorry, distributed, uh, you know, upward of half a million dollar uh, and 87 scholarships to date. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, internships, uh, sorry, scholarships for BIPOC students, Black Indigenous people of color students who are interested in working in wine business. And so far we have uh, pledged uh, half a million dollar over the next five years for a variety of scholarships for that. And those will be again paired with internships and mentorship programs. So, uh, and that's thanks a lot to our community members who have given us uh, uh, these pledges, especially in the wine industry. Um, assisting students with technology equity gaps, as uh, Dr. Josie mentioned, is, is key. Here are a few other strategies we're pursuing. And we want to make sure that we refresh our curriculum and that we offer uh, skills and programs in areas that are in need, in demand, not just now, but in the future, right? So what we hear a lot about is data analytics is key. For example, in the wine industry, wine analytics is is essential for marketing and financial purposes. Uh, digital marketing, uh, everybody in the pandemic has seen how important it is. Uh, switching uh, to a direct to consumer as opposed to uh, distri distribution uh, channels. Uh, FinTech, uh, entrepreneurship and small business, those are all programs we are exploring. Uh, that's, uh, I'm not sure uh, to what extent we'll be able to offer all of these, but we're exploring all of these as, as uh, areas. Um, another thing that I think is key is for us to think of how we can be of service to the region, so the state, the School of Business and Economics. Uh, so the School of Business and Economics houses the Wine Business Institute, which has been of uh, tremendous, um, has had a lot of interaction with the wine industry. And, and what we're exploring is how can we be, how can the Wine Business Institute be more of service to the wine industry? Um, another thing we're exploring is creating a center for entrepreneurship and innovation. And as part of that center, uh, having a small business development program that uh, would provide free consulting to small businesses uh, in, in, in our region. So we're exploring those things. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our program. We have great MBA programs, certificate programs. Uh, please uh, explore those. Uh, in particular, uh, our Sonoma Executive MBA program, uh, which is starting in April. Uh, has a deadline of February 28th to apply. And finally, because uh, we are in uh, COVID times and uh, I'm, I'm not able to meet with people uh, informally, like if we were meeting in person, we might chat at the end. I invite you to join me uh, to for a meet and greet on March 3rd, uh, and you could pre-register pre uh, uh, you know, on, on our website. Uh, and I'm going to stop here and put in the chat that information that I just gave you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. J.F. We're fortunate to have you as part of our business community. Please join Londe and, and Dr. J.F. in answering questions from our audience. I know we're running a little short on time, but I just thought some of these questions really need to be answered for our audience. So let me ask the first one. Um, this came from one of our viewers. During this entire pandemic, I haven't heard of any internet in infrastructure investment. The internet is unstable and too slow in many areas. Which one of you would like to take that one? I can start uh, just by saying that um, 
we spent quite a bit of time over the summer. The governor had convened a task force on business and jobs recovery, and we spent quite a bit of time over the summer uh, in conversations with our internet service providers across the state. Um, you know, closing the digital divide from a, a statewide perspective is a priority. We are looking at places where we have digital deserts, where we have actually very low bandwidth, particularly in some of our uh, most densest uh, urban communities, as well as some of our further out regions where we just don't have the um, the bandwidth and the access for a number of places and a lot of places where people get dropped. Um, that is a, a significant infrastructure investment. Um, we're hoping that as we think about, as to Dr. Eiler's points, the stimulus package that may uh, continue to come to California, that there are um, sufficient dollars there to help us think about extending the investment uh, in that kind of critical infrastructure. But it is also the case where, where we need to look to the service providers to boost um, some of the access. Um, I know that there's some capacity to throttle um, and I'm not sure where they have been. They were very generous at the outset of the pandemic and allowing folks to just have access no matter where they were because it was an emergency. Some of that's been pulled back. So we need to continue to uh, collaborate with our uh, internet service providers around that. Okay, thank you, Long Day. Um, Dr. R, I think, Dr. JF, I believe this is for you. Please talk about the short term, and long day might also be for you as well too. Um, please talk about the short term certificate programs to help reskill and upskill workers to help them stay employed and even increase their wages. Yeah, the, the, this is definitely something we explore. We have a number of certificate programs that are available. Uh, and they're all online right now. And I, I gave a link to those uh, professional programs there. Uh, we're also exploring other things like developing a, a degree completion program uh, I, you know, in business online for working professionals who have some education, but, uh, but haven't completed. Uh, and uh, so we're exploring that. We have partnership with the community colleges for also the Greek community uh, in the region. Uh, and... That's definitely a huge uh, area of reflection. How can we offer more programs for working adults who don't necessarily want a degree as well? So we have a number of those in the wine industry in particular, which is one of our uh, area of, uh, of, of uh, focus in the School of Business and Economics, but in other areas as well. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jaya. All right, guys, I, as much as um, I'd love to answer all your questions, we've got a ton of them, but uh, we're, we seem to be running out of time and I want to, be very cautious of everybody's time right now. What a wealth of information you three have shared with us, Dr. Eiler, Long Day, and Dr. JF. So thank you very much for taking the time to share this information. Some of them are just 45 minutes um, new and, and some of them are as recent, like I said, as November, December. So very, very helpful. Um, thank you as well to our underwriter sponsor, Exchange Bank, and our major sponsors, American River Bank, Gelati Construction, Redwood Credit Union, and of course, Noma State University's School of Business and Economics for making this event all possible. As I mentioned, our mission at the North Bay Business Journal is to provide the most comprehensive report possible on our vibrant business community. Tell us how we're doing in that. Contact me or our editor and our content editor manager, Anthony Borders, anytime and let us know. The journal is planning a special year of recognitions and conferences coming up for 2021. Don't forget to sign up for our next virtual event, the Specialty Food and Beverage Industry Conference on February 26th. But until then, have a safe and happy day.